The human brain is awesomely complex and difficult to understand. But researchers are now unraveling the secrets of how our brain forms and develops from the time we're a small embryo up through adulthood. And that's crucial, because not only does it help us understand who we are, but it'll help us treat and possibly even cure some of the most frustrating diseases, like autism. Correspondent Chad Cohen met the researchers who are finally uncovering clues to what might cause this devastating disease that up till now has been a mystery. This is what most people picture when they think of autism. Dustin Hoffman in the movie Rain Man. Hey man. He's obsessive. Of course it's 27 minutes of Jeopardy. Pra pra practically 26 minutes of Jeopardy. I got my boxer shorts at Kmart Cincinnati. What did I say, Ray? He's repetitive. What did I tell you, Ray? We are not going to Cincinnati, and that's final. I got my boxer shorts at Kmart. Raymond, that is final. Did you hear me? I'm going to be short. He's lost in his own world. In real life, autism is a devastating disorder that seems to be on the rise. It has a wide spectrum of symptoms and clues to what causes them are few and far between. One thing we do know is that it runs in families. These twins, Maya and Evan, both have it. As do brothers, Colin and Liam. Wow, you're doing this so fast. This boy, Jeffrey, is autistic, and so is his brother, Zachary. In fact, when one child in a family has autism, the odds that siblings will have it skyrocket from about 1 in 150 to 1 in 5. This suggests a genetic cause, but so far, autism genes have been elusive. Now, scientists are embarking on the biggest hunt ever to find those genes, and the search is paying off. We were never able to even, you know, Imagine five years ago that we would be able to do the kinds of studies we'd be doing today. It all began with one family that wouldn't take no for an answer. The family of a small boy named Dove Shestak. When Dove was a baby, he seemed pretty normal. He was making eye contact, he was laughing, he was babbling. He would try to get our attention as we walked by, and all those, all the regular little baby things. But when Dove was about a year old, he stopped responding to his name, stopped making eye contact, and finally, he stopped talking. His parents, John and Portia, were told that Dove had autism and was probably severely retarded. There seemed little hope he would ever get better. I couldn't accept the idea of this death sentence on my very young child. Portia took it upon herself to learn all she could about autism. She studied all sorts of literature on the brain and started contacting scientists, literally hunting them down. She went to one of the biggest brain science meetings in the world, held by the Society for Neuroscience, which draws more than 25,000 researchers among them, a geneticist from Boston named Rudy Tanzi. To be quite honest, when I was first contacted by John and Portia, I didn't know anything about autism. But early in his career, Tanzi discovered the first genes that cause another complicated brain disease, Alzheimer's. We never Alzheimer's. He did it by analyzing hundreds of DNA samples from families with Alzheimer's victims. Intrigued by autism's mysterious genetic links, he gave Portia and John a critical piece of advice. I told them that if, if you want to find genes for a disease, the first thing you need is family material. You need families with autism, lots of them, and DNA. Portia put together a team that traveled all over the country, collecting blood from families with at least two autistic children. After a couple of years, she built a scientific gold mine. And here it is, Portia's Autism DNA Bank. It may not look like much, but these are samples from a thousand families. Now, 
tucked away in this rather nondescript looking fridge in Rudy Tanzi's lab. As the search for genes began, there was another puzzling clue about autism. Children don't seem to be born with it. For the first year or so, their brains appear to be developing normally. Most of our brain is formed beautifully by gene programs early in the fetus. And this gives us a brain structure that is similar from one person to the next. The right parts of the brain are wired up appropriately. The symptoms of autism often don't kick in until after the first year of life, as millions of brain cells called neurons connect with each other by sending chemical and electrical signals throughout the brain. For normal brain function, these signals have to be sent at exactly the right place and time. One principle of brain development is timing is everything. Whereas in real estate, it's location, location, location. In the brain, it's when things happen. Since genes control much of brain development, it's possible faulty genes might disrupt the process in autistic children. And those faulty genes might well be hidden somewhere in the new DNA bank. So this is where it all happens. So this is where it happens. To find them, Tansy collaborated with Mark Daly and colleagues at the Broad Institute in Boston, who've developed cutting-edge DNA screening programs. This right here is a gene chip, okay. which performs the ultra-high-resolution DNA fingerprint of each individual. So you take our family, our, our genetic samples from our autistic families, mm -hmm. and you load them onto this chip. Each one of these gene chips contains DNA from an autism family and DNA from a family that's disease-free. Scanners read the DNA sequences, the A's, C's, G's, and T's that make up our genes and compare them. Millions of these chemical bases across the entire human genome can be analyzed in a matter of hours. Any difference between the normal DNA and DNA from the autism bank could be an important clue. And for the most part, you're interested in where there isn't a match. Well, in many cases, that's, that's one of the, the first things that we look for. One place the scientists found a mismatch is on chromosome 16. The dip in this red line reveals a section of the chromosome where a big chunk of DNA with at least 25 genes is missing in some of the autism families. This deletion is rare, but vicious. It increases the risk of autism 100-fold. That may be because some of the missing genes are critical players in wiring the brain. If these genes are broken, then perhaps the circuitry of the brain is broken as well. You may end up with situations in which you have too much information being transferred, not enough information being transferred. Something may not be working in the critical first period of life when so much is being learned and so much is developing and changing in the brain. The team's next discovery was even more interesting. On chromosome number five, they found a stretch of DNA that's present in all of us, but is altered in some of the autism families. It's this particular genetic marker. In the middle of this DNA is a mysterious gene with no known purpose. But its location is a tantalizing hint. It's right next door to a gene called SEMA 5A. We look it up, and we see this gene's involved with how nerve cells connect with each other in building your neural circuitry of the brain during development. The fact that SEMA 5A is so close to the mystery gene is intriguing. Genes in the same neighborhood can have similar functions. Basically, see It's possible that one or both genes could be involved in autism. And significantly, the altered stretch of DNA showed up in almost 10% of the autism families. That's a large enough number to suggest it could play a real role in the disease and an important step toward understanding autism. When you know that there's a gene with a defect, you can think two different ways about it. One is that was the brain not wired correctly in the beginning? And that's the worst case scenario because it's tougher to fix um, a circuit that's not built right. right. But these kids function. 
they can still love, they can still learn. So there's still a lot of optimism that maybe we can go in and if we figure out what's wrong with the neurocircuitry, we can figure out a way to make it work better. So at least improve the lives of these kids. And you know, if we're really lucky, maybe even um, exclude most of the disease symptoms. But it's genes that are teaching us how to do that. Dove Shestak is a remarkable example of how the brain can still function, even with severe autism. Dove had never learned to talk. But when he was nine, he was able to start communicating by pointing to letters on an alphabet board. A galaxy is okay. Uh, he was asked what a galaxy is. G? And to everyone's amazement, he pointed to the letters that spelled out a group of stars. O, U, B group. He knew how to spell, he knew how to read. He had normal intelligence, which we never could be sure of. One of the first things we asked Dove when he began to communicate was, what have you been doing all these years? And he just typed out the word listening. Dove is 17 now. He'll always live with symptoms that make it hard for him to function. But even as he struggles, he goes every week to a bar mitzvah class for autistic children. It's a rite of passage no one ever thought he'd experience. For Dove, his family, and everyone else affected by autism, it's a source of hope. Hope's a very good thing to have. I think you kind of can't live without it. I think that had we not hung on to it then, whether or not people called it false hope or not, um, we wouldn't be where we are now. So I think hope is a very good thing. Uh, who, uh, who did the painting? Uh, who, uh, who did the painting? Who, uh, who did the painting? <laughs>